Hello, this is James Jopling with Shoppers Farm Supply. This is the 2016 Ag Tech program. We're going to be reviewing the components today, which we have. The first of which is a piston. Okay, the questions on this piston, uh, it's got a little bit of scoring on the skirt, just slight scoring. Uh, the first one is the scuffing or scoring on the piston could be a uh, cold start with immediate maximum throttle. And this is absolutely true. The second question, the arrow stamped on the top is indicative as to the direction that the piston should be pointed. And that is also correct. The wear pattern on the skirt of the piston, uh, that could be caused also by dirty oil. This is also correct. And another question is the ring gaps should be perfectly aligned. That is very, very incorrect. They should be staggered at all times, anytime you reinstall. And the final question is that the uh, piston rings, they look fine and can be reused. Uh, I know you probably can't see it, but they do have some slight pitting, so these cannot be used. Now, uh, as to our second component, what we have are resistors. These are common resistors in the electrical circuit. And the first question pertaining to that, if you're using color coding chart, and each one of the resistors has a specific band here that is different colors. And you'll notice that this is brown, black, and brown with a gold stripe on it at the end. Now, the first three are indicative as to the resistance. The third band is indicative as to the uh, tolerance. You can have a 5%, 10%, or 20% tolerance, and it's contingent upon the color of it as to what the tolerance is, tolerance of the total indicated colors. Now, this one, the first question, if you utilize the color code chart, uh, this specific resistor uh, is 20% tolerance. That's incorrect. This is a gold, uh, gold band, which is a 5% tolerance, meaning that this is a 100 ohm resistor. So it would be plus or minus 5, not plus or minus 20. 20 would be if there were no color at all here on this band. And now what we're going to do is the second question is asking if the resistor is within the indicated color code range. So what we're going to do, we're going to utilize the DMM and checking it with the multimeter. It is approximately 98.4, 98.5 ohms. So it's uh, by the color coding, it's a 100 ohm resistor. So that's well within the 5% tolerance. And the third question, uh, we've already answered that uh, color code chart that uh, resistor A is 100 ohms. That is correct. Now, resistor B with the color code <coughs> chart, you look at, uh, look at what it is, red, black, and brown. That is a 200 ohm resistor. Now, it, uh, we're asking if that's within the specification with the color, the uh, tolerance band. And here again, it's uh, 197 ohms, so that's within the 5% band. Uh, the resistor B is within 5% tolerance or resistance. So that is correct. Okay, now for our next component, what we're going to go to is the, this is called a relief valve. And the first question on a relief valve is, it can only be used on John Deere tractors. That's incorrect. This a relief valve is used on any and all makes, and even internationally, uh, within hydraulic systems. If a, and if this valve were to stick open, uh, the second question is that uh, will the pressure increase? That is incorrect. What happens? This is a relief valve. It actually. You'll have pressure coming in here, and it's got a spring that pushes against the plunger, 
and it'll actually relieve and dump the pressure out this port. Now, if your uh, plunger sticks open, it's going to dump fluid. Therefore, you're going to have reduction in pressure. Now, the third question is, is this an adjustable relief valve? Indeed it is. Any relief valve that you have a threaded type of adjusting screw up here which puts pressure on the spring is an adjustable. Generally, a non-adjustable will be capped and sealed off. And next question, is this hydraulically adjustable? No, it's a mechanical adjustment. And the last question, a relief valve such as this is used to control pressure within any hydraulic system. That is correct. Uh, you utilize this in practically any type of hydraulic system that you have. Now, uh, moving on to our next. What we have here is a transmission drive separator plate. Uh, this is commonly used not only in John Deere machines, but in all types of machines, all manufacturing machines. Now, the first question, uh, does it show signs of excessive heat? Excessive heat, generally, you'll see radical discoloration, bluing, and signs of burning on the face of it. And you do not see that. So this hasn't failed. There's a little bit of rust here, but uh, this was not a failure as to excessive heat or slippage. Okay, the next question, is this within warpage specification? This is where we need to, and on all plates, we've always got to look up the specifications, and on this, maximum allowable warpage is 2,000 of an inch. Here I've got a one and a half thousandths feeler gauge, and it will not go in there. So it is within warp specifications. And the next question is, are these holes elongated? No, these are fine. They're perfectly round. So now on the, uh, here's another question. <clears throat> this plate shows signs of severe slippage. There again, if you were to have severe slippage, you would have bluing and dark discoloration on the face of the plate. And also, if you had slippage, that would generate heat, and the heat would therefore cause warpage of the plate. So no, we do not have any signs of severe slippage. Now, next question, there are always two friction discs for each separator plate. That is incorrect for the simple reason you need to have a separator plate, then a friction disc, and another separator plate. If you were to have two friction discs together, then you would have fiber upon fiber, and that would be a catastrophic failure. But now, let's go on to our next component, which is the hydraulic pump. Okay, this is a three-stage hydraulic pump, and you'll notice it's a gear-type pump, which a gear-type pump is going to be an open center pump. And this is capable, this type of pump right here actually is capable of delivering to two different systems, even though this one in actually is for one system, but they use a dual stage pump for it. But it's got pump unit here and a pump unit here. Both are gear type like this. Question number one is the fact, is the question that uh, this tandem pump and that's what this is called as a tandem pump. If it may deliver fluid to two different systems, it may be able to, you know, it's capable of doing that. But uh, this one actually is designed as far as the machine of which it's utilized upon for a uh, single system delivery. Okay, and we reviewed the second question uh, asking if this is an internal gear pump, and it is, uh, as you can see. And the next question, if uh, you reseal this pump unit, will it be good? Are you good to go? Is it good as new? No, it isn't. If you would look at the failure chart and you look at the inside, you'll see some severe scratching and scoring on the inside. 
as to where some debris has gotten in there and eroded some of that aluminum housing. Therefore, you're going to have a reduced fluid displacement from the pump. So no, this one would not be <coughs> up to uh, specification just by resealing. Now, it, uh, the next question pertains to this pump will deliver constant volume at all speeds. That is incorrect. It is a gear-driven pump. Therefore, the volume is contingent upon the speed of rotation. The higher the speed, the greater the volume that will be displaced from this particular type of pump, from a gear pump. So that, that is false. And the last question, is this for closed center hydraulic pump? No, this is gear driven. A gear type pump is an open center pump. Okay, we shall move on to our next component. Now, the next component is rather simplistic. Everybody's familiar with it, it's battery. Okay, the uh, first question, CCA is an acronym for constant cranking amps. Uh, that is incorrect. It's an uh, acronym for cold cranking amps. Now, the next question, connecting two 12-volt batteries in parallel will double the voltage. If you connect two batteries in series, you'll be adding voltage from the first to the voltage in the second. Connecting in parallel will only increase the amperage, not the voltage. Next question, concentration of H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid, is important. Your electrolyte composition, your concentration within the battery is very, very critical. A lot of people continue to add water to them, and the batteries tend not to have the uh, cranking capability because you're reducing the amount of sulfuric acid concentration within there. So that is very, very important. Now, each cell does have potential of two volts. You notice that this has six cells in it. So it would be two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Next question was, uh, is each, does each cell have potential of twelve volts? No. Single cell right here, that's got the potential of two, vo uh, two volts each. All right, now, as far as the specifications on the battery, that is what the next question is. This battery will start an engine which requires 2.5K, which is 2,500 cold cranking amps if the engine starts quickly. That is incorrect for, if you look at specification, cold cranking amp is 925 amps. So that wouldn't be nearly enough. Yeah, because you, if it's requesting 2,500, and you've only got 925, no, that would not be sufficient. So let's move on to our next component. Okay, this is a belt now. This came off of an XUV, uh, what John Deere calls the gator. <coughs> okay, the first question, is this a banded V-belt? Uh, this is a V-belt, but it's not banded. A banded V-belt would be one or two belts that are actually have an outer band to band them together. So that is incorrect. Okay, now this type of belt is generally used on a variable pitch drive. And that's, that was the next question. That's true. You know, this type of belt, you can see the ribbing on the inside and the support structure on the outside. And the next question, is it exhibiting internal core failure? No, if you look, there is a little bit of breakage, but nothing substantial. You see no evidence of internal cord failure. And the next question was, will this belt perform as a new one? No, it will not. You notice it's scraping and on the outside to where it did show signs of slippage, so no, it will not perform the same as a new one. And the last question for this belt was, this damage due to obstruction? No, it's just due to excessive slippage. So with that covered, let's go to our next component. Now this is a fiber disc. 
A while ago, we reviewed the separator plate. The separator plate would actually go up against this on each side of this. This is a fiber disc. This is actually what, when it compresses, the separator plates compress together, this is what actually grabs. Okay, now, the, uh, here again, we're going to measure and see if it's within specification. What, uh, looking it up, on specifications, it should be 127 to 133 thousandths of an inch. And we mic it. And we have 131 thousandths of an inch. So it is within specification. So that's great. And on the spec sheet, uh, and there again, anytime you look in a tech manual, you'll need to see where these components are and become familiar with it. But yes, this can be used in either B1 or B2 pack. And that is on this uh, spec sheet of which we have. Okay, the next question is, the teeth on here, do they have excessive wear? And you do see just a tad bit of wear, but nothing excessive. You sometimes would see them rounded off or pointed sharply. If that were the case, then that would be excessive wear. But in this particular instance, there's very, very minimal wear as far as the teeth are concerned. Okay, now the next question, this is made of total steel composition. No, it's not. This is a fiber on the outside. The center of it indeed is steel, but the outside is a fiber. Now, the last question in this particular unit is, can it be used uh, with no, con no concerns of longevity? You do see some signs of slippage close to it in here on the inside as to where some of the fiber is eroded. And especially on this side, you do so show signs of slippage. So this would not be used again. Even though it is within specifications, we cannot use this plate again. Now, let's go to our next component. Okay, now these are electronic components. Now, this first one, what we're going to do, um, we have, first of all, we have a brief description of resistor, capacitor, a diode, LED, IC, which is integrated circuit, and a reed switch. Now, this first one is called a reed switch. And I don't know if we can focus in clear enough how this functions, but you can see when a magnet gets close, how it closes. You can actually hear it. Okay, that is how a small shifter functions uh, in, in a tractor. Whenever you bump shift with your shifter, it actually has a magnet in there that causes a switch like that, which is t very, very tiny, to close and send a signal back to the control unit, back to the processor. But uh, back to our questions, it's asking, is A a reed switch? Yes, A is a reed switch. Is B a diode? No, this is a capacitor. Is F an integrated circuit? Yes, this is an integrated circuit, which an integrated circuit is multiple circuits in one tiny little encasement that has leads that run out here to all these little legs. Uh, but yes, this is an integrated circuit. And E, is this a diode? No, here again, you can see the color coding, the same as earlier, and that, that is a resistor. And D is an LED, that's correct, that's a light emitting diode. Now this is a di just a regular diode, okay. Now, let's move on to our next component. Okay, this is a digital multimeter, uh, and it's just very, very basic questions on functionality of the uh, multimeter. Now, the first one is, the resistance of test leads only needs to be in check that the leads are intact. Uh, resistance of leads does not need to be considered when measuring specific component or circuit. 
uh, that's false because you have to take the resistance of the leads into consideration when you are measuring any individual component or circuit because that resistance of the leads which can be anywhere from half ohm up to two or three ohms that can change your judgment as to the health of that particular circuit so if you are two or three ohms high you might deduct that that particular circuit and or component is faulty so you can be replacing the component needlessly so no that uh, you've got to measure the resistance of the test leads every time just about every time that you utilize that meter okay uh, to test 10 amp, 10 amp del delivery meter must be set to MA scale milliamp right here is for it's that's for milliamps one thousandths of an amp so if you're going to test 10 amps you do not have it on milliamp scale you'll burn your meter up or damage it uh, the acronym for DMM is a digital multimeter that's correct this is a digital multimeter and the next question is this meter can only measure resistance and DC voltage no practically every multimeter every digital multimeter uh, you this, this line right here with the dots that's DC voltage then you have AC voltage the little squiggle and then you have battery and this one you can actually measure temperature you can have a diode check then you have resistance so that's that question is false okay this meter is only capable of measuring up to 10k AC volts 10k AC volts that's 10,000 AC volts on your AC scale it goes up to 600 volts maximum anything above that and you will damage your meter okay let us go to our next component Okay, our next component is a cylinder, and I'm sure many of y'all have worked with cylinders before. Now, this is a double-acting cylinder. You've got a port at each end. Now, what that is, is you can apply fluid at this end of it, and it's going to force it in this direction, which it'll discharge low-pressure fluid out of this end. Or you can actually introduce pressurized fluid into this end, and it'll force it in this direction and forcing low pressure to return oil out this end. So, yeah, it'll, it can move it back and forth with force. Now, single acting cylinder, you would only have something like a vent over on this end as to where you would put pressure here just to move it in that direction. And for it to move back in this opposite direction, you would have something uh, the weight of the implement, something like that, to actually return the cylinder back. So that would be a single acting, but in this case, this is a double acting cylinder. All right, now we're going to measure the cylinder rod again. It's asking if, it, uh, if this cylinder rod is within specification of 1.425 inches. Now, miking it, We have one inch, 124 thousandths of an inch. So that, that's false. That is not within the specification. Okay, here's another question. If there's equal flow pre and pressure to the cylinder, it will react in both directions concerning force and rate. That is incorrect. One thing of which you must take into consideration is the surface area of the piston where your oil and pressure your pressure and volume are being applied on this end you have this full surface area right here on this end when the rod is slid all the way down to it you're not going to have any force applied to this part of it only to the outside part 
So you're not going to have the surface area of which you're applying the hydraulic force to, to be able to apply the same amount of force in this direction as you do this direction. So you'll actually have faster react and more hydraulic strength, so to speak, in this direction than you will this direction just due to the rod taking up that much of the surface area of the piston itself. Okay, that, uh, so that would be false. And the next question, uh, this hydraulic cylinder is only a single acting cylinder? No, it's, it's double acting. Now, here's, here was kind of a silly question. Uh, the entire cil cylinder, once you reseal it, will be fully operational. No. No, that's, that's the only problem with that. It's, it's the rod has been. And we went over the last question. If the rod diameter is taken into consideration when applied hydraulic force upon the rod into the piston, calculating the surface area of force, the force will be the same on the open face sides. And it will not be the same. We've already covered that. But anyway, uh, let's go to our next component. Now this is what's commonly described as a pencil injector. Notice it does look like a pencil. Okay. And you have your injector housing, and this is actually your plunger that goes down into your housing. And you've got your spring, of which is adjustable to adjust how much pressure it takes to open it up. And essentially, that's uh, how that injector works. But uh, question number one, if the return spring fails in the injector, it will not displace any fuel into the combustion chamber. Think about this. If this spring were to fail, what would happen to this? It would allow this to be freely opened. Your fuel's coming in here. This would freely open, and it would dump fuel. So that's false. If it were to stick closed, then you would not have any displacement to the cylinder. Okay, next question. This injector, uh, once reassembled, will be fully functional. You'll notice that the spring is broken. So, no, it would not be fully functional. Now, we partially covered this. Uh, if a plunger sticks or binds closed, fuel will not be displaced into the combustion chamber. That's correct. There again, you've got fuel coming in, and when fuel comes in, if this tip is closed off, it's not going to allow anything to go into the combustion chamber. Now, here's another one. If the injection pump is delivering 1K PSI, which is 1,000 PSI, when the injector is calibrated uh, to 3.5K PSI, 3,500 PSI, the fuel displacement to the combustion chamber will be the same, only slower. No, uh, you've got to have 3,500 PSI displaced inside of here to overcome the spring pressure for this plunger to be able to move back for the fuel to flow down and be displaced to the combustion chamber. So it will not be slower, it just will not be discharged at all. Now, the last question, if the excess fuel line leaks, this will reduce displacement of the injector. No, the, uh, the excess fuel line, which actually fits onto the top of this, uh, just bleeds off extra fuel. So that's not going to change anything that's in the delivery phase of this. So whatever's displaced in here, is gone ahead, dumped into the combustion chamber, and then the extra comes out. If you've got a leak up here, that's irrelevant. That it's just it's going to be a fuel leak, but it's not going to change how the engine runs. Now let's get to our next component. Now this is a single roll radial ball bearing, and. I'm sure everybody's played with these before, but uh, that's, that's ac actually what it's called, single roll radial. Okay, now 
The first question is one must only use a brass hammer on the outer race to install it on a shaft. So if you're installing this on a shaft like that and you're hammering on the outside, what is happening on the inside of this race where these balls are when it's hitting up against this side of it? You're causing what's called, called brunelling. It's actually putting little bitty tiny dents in this when you're trying to force it down on the inside and hitting it on the outside. You're just putting little bitty dents all the way around on the race of that bearing. So that, uh, no, you never use a hammer when you're trying to force it down inside of here. Uh, the next question is uh, pretty well common sense that after you clean a ball bearing, you should dry it with compressed air by holding it on the inside and blowing it on the outside and making it spin as fast as you possibly can. That can cause this cage to actually come apart, cause the bearing to fail, and that could hurt. That could actually hurt you physically. Now, the next question is, roller bearings must always be preloaded. That's incorrect. These bearings do not, 90% of the time they are not preloaded at all. Um, they must be free floating, just like that. Uh, a conular bearing, a cone type bearing, yes, they will be preloaded, but this one will not be. Okay, if, next question, if the bearing is hammered in place on either race, this could cause Brunel's on the race and cause the bearing to fail. Uh, now we have already spoken about that briefly, and any time you put little dents on the inside of a bearing race, what happens is you're actually causing micro fractures. And whenever that bearing, which is a hardened steel bearing, keeps rubbing over it, it's going to cause it to start flaking, cracking, and it will cause a failure any time you have impact damage or Brunel's. Okay, there's another thing. Whenever you use ball bearings with a rubber belt application, you can cause arc erosion of the bearing surface, which uh, arc erosion, it'll actually cause arc, electrical pits. You can have static generation, and it'll cause electrical pits to be put in there. And that's, uh, there again, you're pitting the bearing, and it'll cause failure. Now, let's get on to our next component. This is somewhat a typical ground speed sensor. It's utilized with many, many, many different applications and many manufacturers. Okay, the first question pertaining to this is measuring with a DMM, is this within voltage specification? This has no voltage just sitting here stagnant. Uh, you, you measure resistance, not voltage. Okay, now on the specifications, the tone wheel clearance, which is a clearance between the wheel that will cause slight generation of electricity. You know, you'll have a wheel that has teeth on it, or you can have a gear, something such. Whenever that metal passes over it, it'll actually cause a small amount of generation. But uh, the clearance should be 50 thousandths to 875. Okay. The, if the clearance is only a half inch, 500 thousandths of an inch, the indicated speed will be accurate. Okay, if you have 0 0.0875 inches, clearance in between here and the tone wheel versus a half inch. Now, you're not going to have near the generation of this particular sensor. So no, it will not function properly. You probably won't even get anything out of it. Okay, now this does have an internal magnet uh, and it's got an electrical wire coil built around it. Okay. Now, the next question, testing to see if it's within resistance specification. The resistance generally on this type, particular type of sensor 
is 2,800 to 3,200, 3, ohms. So it, uh, you can pretty well, by rule of thumb, say three kilo ohms. Uh, so if we put our meter, okay, now I, I know what this one is, but uh, we're testing resistance, and that was the next question, is, does it meet the 3K? No, this is only approximately 4.8 to 4.9 ohms. So no, that is not within specification. Now, the, uh, the last question, is the uh, current generated proportional to the speed of the tone wheel or the flywheel tooth? Uh, that is correct. That's how you're actually sensing speed is you know, the voltage, so to speak, output of this. Now, if, uh, if you're just moving slow, and it's just passing very slowly, you're not going to have near the generation if you pass very, very quickly. So the current generated will be proportional to the speed of the tone. So that is correct. Okay, let's move on to our next component. Okay, now this is a typical for many manufacturers. This is a uh, air conditioner fan speed resistor. This actually is what controls the speed of the blower motor, so to speak. <coughs> okay, inside here, you've got three different coils, which are resistive coils, and then you've got what's described as a thermofuse. Okay, thermofuse actually protects you know, many other circuits. That's that little guy right in here, that's, that's described as thermofuse. Okay, that protects a lot of the other circuits from damage. If we should have something go awry, if we have a motor short out, or if we have some kind of problem with the circulation, uh, the pressurizer blower to where it's not being able to cool this. So, and what we're doing is we're essentially going to test this unit to see how well, uh, if it's good or not. Now, if we go from point A to point B, that's for that thermal fuse, that's for that little protective fuse in there. So we're going to go from point A to point B, measuring resistance just to see it should be closed if we are intact. And that shows open circuit. So this particular unit has failed. The thermal fuse is bad. Now, if we test from the second question, testing with DMM from A to C, which is that one to this one, and we've eliminated the thermal fuse out of the circuit. Now, it is finding resistance of 100 ohms. No, it's less than one ohm. It's, get it stabilized here but it, it is less than one ohm. So, that question is false. Testing with DMM A to E is, that first one was approximately six tenths. Uh, that's 1.0 to 1.2 ohms A to E, and that is greater than other points that you can measure because what we're doing we're going from this one to that one which is no excuse me this one right here will be going through this coil this coil and then this coil that is what we're measuring the total of those three so that is the maximum resistance so that's false. Okay, now this question, if we connect to terminal C, that'll provide the slowest speed. Thinking about it logically, if we go from C, which is this point on that coil, to A right there, we're only going through a single coil that's going to provide the next to fastest speed because you're only going through one resistor instead of three. Connecting fan motor to terminal E from A, you'll be going through all three resistor coils, so you're going to have the slowest speed. So that one will be correct. 
Now, let's move on to our next component. Okay, this is the flow meter. You notice how freely it spins. Um, now, the first question is asking uh, if flow meters can only measure liquid. Now, a flow meter can measure gases. It can, it can be used to measure practically anything. Anything, you notice that there's a turbine wheel in here that will spin quite freely. Now, that turbine wheel, whether it be a gas or a liquid, is going to spin. And you'll notice our little induction pickup a little sensor right here anytime this spins then it's going to generate a signal right here so it can measure liquid it can measure gas it can measure anything okay so that first question is false uh, if a turbine is worn or binding the flow indicated will be inaccurate that's correct anytime that you would cause this to bind or slow then you're not going to get the correct indication now, even though you're displacing the same amount of volume, then if that's binding up, then it's not going to rotate nearly as fast, so you're not going to get the correct indication. This is somewhat a common failure. These are used widely on sprayers, uh, and they'll get dirty, and you'll have chemical residue buildup, and it will cause it to drag, and you will not have the correct indication. Now, the next question is if you have this installed backwards, will it indicate backwards? No. All it's doing is that every time this little turbine spins, it's sending an impulse into the sensor and it's reflected back. It matters not which direction it spins. All it is doing is it's, pe it's picking up each time that little turbine wheel passes over. This essentially, basically, is the same as our speed sensor as we reviewed earlier. Okay, this does have an internal electromagnet. So, uh, next question, if the power provides has failed to the internal electromagnet, uh, the indication will be slightly degraded. No, you've got to have, and this one takes a 5-volt signal source, a 5-volt uh, source for the electromagnet within the sensor. So if you lose that, you're going to lose total function of this particular uh, sensor. Now, the next one, if the turbine blades are worn 675 thousandths, uh, no volumetric indication, differential will be noted. Now, any time you take any material away from the edge of that turbine, you're going to increase the distance, just as our earlier speed sensor. You're going to increase the distance, and also you're going to decrease the surface area for fluid or air application for turbine movement. So now, any kind of wear or damage, that's going to influence your indication. So now, let's move on to our next component. Next component is a main bearing out of a 13.5 liter engine. <coughs> okay, this one, okay, you can see it's pretty, in pretty rough shape. Uh, now, the first question is, the da is damage due to embedded dirt? We really, if we look closely, you don't see much as far as contamination. Uh, damage on this particular bearing. You would see evidence of dirt or debris in there, and you don't see that on this particular bearing. And the next question is if it, the damage uh, was caused by tapered journals. Now, if you had a tapered journal, think about it. The way it's cradled in there, if it were cradled at an angle, that's a tapered journal, then you would have wear on one side of it and not the other side of it. So this is not due to a tapered journal. Uh, you know, because you would see Babbitt over here and excessive wear on that end. So no, that was not due to uh, tapered journals. Now the next question is, 
is this likely caused by lack of lubrication? Yes. If you look at the failure charts here, um, you let's review it, and that is definite lack of lubrication because the way it's worn, but it's worn equally, so we don't have taper journal problems. Okay, uh, do they show to be installed correctly in the correct direction? Yes, because they've got little notches, so to speak, that they fit into. So that's correct. So that's not a problem there. Okay, and last question. If it had starting issues such as dead batteries just before it failed, when they jump started, uh, could it ground pass through and cause this damage? No. No, that wouldn't do to uh, electrical arc and ground passing. So uh, that's about it on bearings. Let's go to our next one. Okay, this is our first electrical board. Now, we've got this ra rather simple circuit. Um, the first question, are all these lamps wired in series? All right, if you look at how they are laid out here, you'll see how the positive comes in, comes over to this, and then it comes over to this lamp, and then the bottom of this lamp comes over here to this one, to this, through the switch, up here, then back up here, back up here, and back up there. Now, these two lights are a parallel circuit. You see that you take that out, then you would have just a simple series circuit. A series circuit being one after another. Parallel, parallel means equal. Okay. This one goes over here. So this is a parallel circuit. And you've got these two coming around and back over here, which generates a series circuit. So you have both parallel and series circuits. So with that first question, are all the lamps wired in series? No, they're not. They're wired, you've got both a parallel and a series circuit. Now, the next question, is the entire board fuse protected? This particular circuit is definitely fuse protected because you see it's coming over here and then through fuse and back up here. And it really matters not if you've got the fuse before the device or after the device. Yeah, it, it's irrelevant. As long as you have that fuse in there, if you have a short circuit on this end, it's still going to overload your source and it's going to blow the fuse. So yes, this is completely fuse protected. Okay, the, uh, this lamp, we're going to power it up. The third question, the lamp on board B is not illuminated due to lack of pass-through amperage within the entire circuit. If we power it up and turn it on, you notice that this lamp is not illuminated. But why is that? Because we've got voltage coming in. It comes through here, through our switch and our fuse, and back up there to that. Okay, let me ask this question. Why is this light lit up? You've got power coming in, and then you're going to a ground through that lamp. If that lamp is bad, why is this lamp lit up? What it boils down to is this light actually is trying to illuminate. Um, you can't see it but it actually does have current passing through the filament. However, it's a very, very low amount of current because the current's coming through this lamp and then going through there. This acts like, kind of like a garden hose. It's small and this is like a fire hose. It takes that much to actually fill it up electrically, amperage like, uh, to illuminate it. So you, you're restricting the amount of current flow by that small filament right there. And we're going to have another in a moment of which we'll exemplify that once again. 
but essentially that's that fire hose can't be filled up it's just getting a slight trickle but the element is intact here for the simple reason you're getting passed through now if we were to take unplug that it works so that's there's just so much restriction in the filament of that small bulb that it cannot provide sufficient amperage to this large bulb okay now we're being asked to uh, test both the terminals on the board B which is a, this large one and the available voltage is what we're going to be reading. We're going to set it on 12 volt scale. Actually, what we're going to be reading is what's described as voltage drop. Approximately 1.01 .01 volts voltage drop between there. Um, that's not available voltage. That's that's voltage drop. Uh, and I encourage everybody to study what is on this as far as voltage differential, available voltage, rate, voltage potential, and voltage drop. Um, that that's something which you need to keep in mind at all times. Um, and here again, the uh, lamp on. Bulb B is not illuminated to, due to a bad fuse. We've already reviewed that and reviewed the uh, reasons why this is not illuminated. Even though it is going through the fuse, uh, you just don't have adequate current to be able to illuminate that element. So let us go to our next component board. Okay, this is James Joplin again with Shoppers Farm Supply. Now this next uh, electrical board, this component board, is a little bit more difficult than the one prior, but still essentially the same. Um, we're incorporating a relay, a single pole double throw relay, and along with a fuse and a switch, and a large single element light, uh, two LEDs, and a single LED. Now the first question is, just very, very simple. Is this complete circuit fuse protected? Uh, here again, if we look, okay, you see it. Our positive comes down. It is connected to the top of the fuse. And then down at the bottom of the fuse, it's connected. And it comes back over here to terminal 30 of the relay. However, it is not fuse protected, even though the fuse is partially in the circuit because we've got a jumper that goes from this point to this point. So no, it, the circuit is not fuse protected. So if you have any issues, you'll have the magic blue smoke escape uh, instead of the fuse blowing. Now the next question, uh, only one of the LEDs on this board is illuminated due to polarity when the switch is off. The switch is turned off and we can turn the switch on and it illuminates the other one. But yes, you have, there's one LED that actually is opposite as far as the anode and cathode that are mounted backwards. So yeah, it's uh, only one is turned on due to the anode cathode polarity. Now that's with the switch turned off. Okay. that current passes through terminal 30 and then 87A over here and that's a true question uh, it that coil is not energized so it naturally relaxes and makes a connection on the other terminal which is 87A and it completes the circuit over to here and then we're coming from that up to our ground which is also the 85 connection on the relay. And that's ground for the relay and we're interconnecting this LED light emitting diode over to that point which is grounded. Now when we turn the light switch on what it does is it energizes the coil within here 
and instead of 87A being the connection point within that relay, it interconnects with terminal 87 within that relay since it clicked over. Okay, and it completes the circuit from that terminal 87 over to bulb B, and then it comes over to this LED, which comes back over here, and there again it comes over to the ground. Okay, and it illuminates this LED. Now, it does empower this board and this board. Okay, when you have power to those two, uh, the next question is why isn't this illuminated? Uh, is the filament bad? No, the filament is not bad. Here again, it's just the same as the other board, uh, except kind of in reverse. We've got such a small, small pathway for electron flow through this LED that it cannot supply adequate uh, current flow to illuminate this bulb. So, no, we don't have a problem with this bulb. We could actually just jump over here with this and it would just illuminate that bulb just like that, confirming that that bulb is good. Um, but yeah, it's just current flow there again uh, that this LED cannot displace enough for illumination of that bulb. Now, let's, with those questions answered, and anytime you feel free, just you can email us or call us, and uh, we'll be glad to help you with any questions. But let's move to our last board and review all of that. Now, here again, we have a relatively basic, simple circuit. Okay, which, you know, we've got the switch and the fuse and the three light bulbs, the small, what, are somewhat license plate lights and then like a dome light uh, or backup light. Now with this, the first question, are there both series and parallel circuits? And here we're falling back on that again and that's very, very important to be able to decipher between a series and a parallel circuit. Um, is this, are there both series and parallel circuits within this entire circuit? Uh, there indeed are, but here again, this, this is a little twist on what we had a while ago. You know, we're coming in from the switch to this, to this one, through this one, and through this one. This is going to be series right here. And then it's going to jump over and go to ground. So this is a series circuit because it's in a series, like a world series. It's one after another after another. And that's what this is. It's series circuit that goes up here. But we also have a parallel circuit because we're feeding power not only to this circuit at the same power providence point, we're feeding it to this circuit at the same time. Then we're going to ground and over here. So it's got both series and parallel circuits. And there again, that is very, very important to remember and be able to decipher. Okay, uh, so that's true. There are both series and parallel circuits within the entire circuit. Now, the next question, if bulb on this board, board C, were to fail, uh, board B would not illuminate. That's false because here again, we've got parallel circuits. These are somewhat independent circuits. You're coming over with your power feed and then output. So this circuit, even though these are in series, this has no influence on it at all. So if the, uh, if this bulb were to fail, the only, fa the only problem you would have is it would not illuminate this because you would not have any current flow coming through here. It would just be open and it wouldn't have any path to be able to come back through here and illuminate that. There wouldn't be any current whatsoever. So the only two, you could have a failure in the filament here or this filament right here. And it would cause this portion of the circuit not to illuminate. But this is its own little independent circuit. We could actually take this completely out and that part of the circuit would function. 
So that's false. Now here once again, and uh, I am stressing this, uh, it's very, very important. This entire circuit is fuse protected. It is not fuse protected. If you look at how it's laid out right here, through the fuse and then through the switch and on, we still have that jumper in here. We've got to always check and see, and this is an issue with many machines. People do put jumpers in. So this, you've got to be able to study and decipher, is it fuse protected or is it not fuse protected? There again, that's a very critical, important point that I like to make. And the next question, if this bulb on B, if the filament were to fail, then neither one of these would illuminate. Uh, there again, it's just like we were discussing earlier. This is its own independent circuit. We, if we took this completely out of the loop, forget about this. This is its own independent circuit right here. So if, board, if bulb B were to fail, it would have no influence on what occurs in, on either one of these two boards. <coughs> so that one's false. Now the last question, if uh, he wants us to test from top of terminal, uh, the top terminal of B over to here, that should be 12 to 13 volts, whatever supplied voltage is. And it's not going to be because it's it's ground. It's just a direct ground to ground. If we were to come anywhere else, yeah, we would have voltage indication, but this is just ground to ground. Uh, and here again, if in your false manuals you have got the three different circuit types, please study that, remember that, and that'll help you throughout a lot of your studies and analysis of circuitry. So that pretty well wraps up all of our components for the year 2016. Uh, this is James Joplin again with Shoppers Farm Supply and thank you very much. Call if you have any questions. Thank you.